Today on Being Disciples, we will look at how living stones are fit together to be built into the wall, the wall of salvation, and protects the hearts of the believers. We will explore how this all comes together today, and I will be joined by my wife Sue and friend Carol Lemke for a conversation on the love between believers. Welcome to the Being Disciples podcast with Pastor John. All notes, video links can be found at virtualstudywith.us. That's virtualstudywith.us. Uh, this weekly podcast published every Monday that is meant to help believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ to mature in their faith. These principles should be useful to anyone who listens, but especially for the believers who are called to be disciples of Jesus Christ. You are invited on a journey to explore what it means to be a disciple. And this is going to be a great time, guys, let me tell you. Well, let's begin by joining Pastor John with an opening prayer. Pastor John. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for so great a love that you have for us, that you sent your only begotten Son to redeem us and to restore us into a right relationship with you. Thank you, Jesus, that for the joy set before you, you were willing to leave the majesty of heaven to come into this world, your creation, to redeem us and to restore us into a loving relationship with the Father. Thank you for laying down your life for us, both in the living of it and in the dying. In life, you showed us how we ought to live in intimacy with the Father, following the leading of the Holy Spirit and loving one another. In death, you gave your body for us, bruised for our iniquities, wounded for our transgressions, beaten, battered, and bloodied, even pierced to the shedding of your blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Now we ask you to give us the words to say and to open our ears and hearts to hear what you would say to us. Please bless all who join us today and all who hear this message, even the recording at a later time. We thank you. Amen. Now let's get on with the lesson for today. Today we are looking at stones becoming walls. We have looked at the foundation upon which we rebuild or repair the walls and the cornerstone, Jesus Christ, with the foundations being the apostles and the prophets. In 1 Peter chapter 2, we saw the building upon the foundation with living stones, the stones being the righteous or faithful ones. This was no ordinary stone wall. The walls are first and foremost to protect the hearts of the people. We find the idea of the believers being living stones, being built upon the foundation with the cornerstone being Christ Jesus in the first epistle of Peter chapter 2. We looked at this in earlier sessions. We also discussed that the walls are first and foremost to protect the hearts of the people and we saw this in Proverbs 4:23, where it says keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the springs of life. We need to protect our heart what goes in because what goes in is what comes out. We've also explored the idea that the walls are salvations. The living stones are the believers who have their Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And salvations are additions of stones to the walls, building up of the wall. We see in the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 26, it says we have a strong city. He sets up salvation as walls and bulwarks. In chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. So in chapter 12, we see about joy and proclaiming and shouting and praising God. And in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 18, the second part says, You shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The purpose of the gates is to establish the atmosphere within the city walls. What is let in, what is not let in. We discussed this in an earlier study. As far as the walls go, what are the purposes of walls? In the natural, they establish boundaries, they provide security, they're defense from attacks, there's a prevention of infiltration, they cause a separation, they uh, offer structural support, there's a restraint or enclosure, a sense of safety. It is not much different for the spiritual. We also took a look at Paul calling us a temple of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he writes, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? So our body is a temple, but he relates it to being the walls. As he says in Ephesians chapter 2, discussing the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, he goes on to say, In whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. 
So this building up of the walls is building the temple in which the Holy Spirit dwells. We are the body of Christ. We looked at the cornerstone, Christ Jesus. The foundation is the apostles and prophets, the living stone of the believers. The stones becoming walls or the body of Christ joined and together and in unity with the righteousness and justice of God. And I have said and I continue to say that my belief is that the mortar is love. Love is what binds us together. Love is what strengthens us as a common body, which causes us to support one another, watch over one another. So we discussed the idea of living stones becoming walls, the stones being fit together. And Paul expresses this idea of love being the key in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. He says, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So again, about being the body of Christ from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So again, it's all about loving one another. And this is echoed by the Apostle Peter in his letter again in chapter 2 of his first epistle. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, that's Jesus Christ the cornerstone, he says, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house, built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Paul echoes this yet again in the letter of 1 Corinthians in chapter 3. He says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Paul goes on again about this same issue in Colossians chapter 2. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery which is in Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So Paul is trying to get us to understand that it's the love of God flowing through us toward one another. And in drop down to verse 19 in chapter 2, he says, And not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God, the love of God flowing through us. There's a little side note here. We also see that uh, in First Chronicles 29 and in Isaiah 54, it talks about precious stones and the foundations, and that the precious stones are set in antimony. Now, what is antimony? It's an interesting study that if you go through it, you can find many parallels to the Christian faith. First of all, it's a semi-metal. In its metallic form, it's silvery, hard, and brittle. And silver is a color of justice. Antimony is used with electronics, uh, makes semiconductor devices, such as infrared detectors and diodes. It's almost always alloyed with something like lead or other metals to improve its hardiness and strength, so it won't be quite so brittle. And it has many uses in the electronics industry. Antimony compounds are used to make flame retardant materials, such as paints and enamels, glass, and pottery. Now think about it. The believer being rescued from the fires of hell is basically made flame retardant. And antimony is not an abundant element. It's found in small quantities in over 100 mineral species. So it's, it's found mixed in with other things. And think about the believer, rare amongst the greater population, mixed in with the other people of the world. It's found and extracted out by the Lord. And China produces about 88% of the world's antimony. Think about the underground church in China and the pressure it's under, and to find the precious souls that have surrendered to Christ Jesus. So that's an interesting little rabbit trail if you want to do a study on antimony. Now, we go on to see that Paul is teaching, as well as the other apostles, about the growth of the body. This is the body of Christ, so it's the growth of each one of us coming together as a unit. We see, first of all, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the building up of one another through encouragement. It says, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. In Romans, Paul tells us in chapter 14 about the pursuit of mutual good. He says, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. That's taking care of one another and praying for one another and praying regularly. In the first chapter of Jude, it says, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. And then in Ephesians 4 again, we see the equipping of the body. And this is mainly talking about the fivefold ministry, but it is 
a responsibility of each one of us to some degree. In, in verse 12 of chapter 4, it says, To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. And then in Hebrews chapter 10, we talk about stimulating one another. It says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. So that's stimulating one another to love and to do good works. In edification, that's the building up of one another. In 1 Corinthians 14, it says, So with yourself, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in the building up of the ecclesia. So then we look a little deeper at the fivefold ministry, and that is in Ephesians chapter 4, basically verses 11 through 14. And we see that there, there are given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And these gifts are given by God to the body of believers for the purpose of equipping the saints. Now, does every believer slot into one of these five? Well, no and yes. God gives these gifts as he sees fit to individuals to minister to the body overall. However, if you examine yourself and those around you, you will see traits of each one of these five gifts within one another and maybe multiple signs within a person. We see that the apostles basically cast the vision of the kingdom or prophets declaring the truth of the word. And we do that with one another when we discuss scripture or the evangelist sharing the gospel message or the pastor caring for the needs of the body, or we see the teacher instructing in the ways of God. And we all do little bits of this here and there within our lives and our conversations with one another or with those that we're leading into a relationship with Almighty God. So the question is, for each one of us, is all of this being done here? Is there organic growth within us of this happening? Each of us must ask, is this being done by me? In 1 Peter 3.15, we see, he says, Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. So with our salvation comes this hope in Jesus Christ, in his return and his deliverance and his healing, uh, eternal life beyond this world. We have this hope. And Peter is saying, always be ready to defend that hope to anyone who asks. And the reason being is as we explain our hope that we have, It adds hope to their lives as well, gives them something to hope in, and leads them into the ways of life everlasting. All of these acts are are ways of loving one another. It's the body joined together and unified, one body, one spirit, one hope. We have one God and Father. We have the body of Christ. And again, like I said, I am his. He created me. I am his. He redeemed me. I am his. I have surrendered to him, surrendered my life to him, so I am his. And each member of the wall, each living stone, each salvation is part of that wall. But the walls are only as good as they can be when they're manned and maintained. Part of this is the job of the pastor, giving attention to those who need this love and unity. And part of the responsibility is on the watchmen on the walls. And sometimes this is the prophetic, to see what is coming. The watchman has basically three jobs here. To see what is coming, what God is doing, then proclaim it to the people, and then see how the people react to it. And then God deals with the rest. He instructs us through the teachers. He encourages us with the apostles and prophets. He cares for us through the pastors. And the evangelists are usually passionate about the truth of the word of God. So strong walls is what we're after. And they are bound by the mortar of love and loving one another. They are strengthened in ministry through the effectiveness of a five-fold ministry that's doing its job. And so we, again, have the apostles framing things up, what the vision of God is, the prophet who provides the hope with the truth of the word of God, the apostles and the prophets who are the foundation, and that's not being at the top, that's being the lowest of the low in a place of service and of building things up, of supporting those in the body so they can go out and do the ministry of the kingdom of God. Then you have the evangelists who, who are communicating the truth of the gospel and the word of God. And the pastors who are trying to help people with their healing and discipling and, and deliverance. And we have the teachers who equip people with the knowledge and, and the ways of God, the principles to live by. And we need all of these roles for a healthy body, all of these roles in love for the strong walls. In the first epistle of John chapter four, it says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. And we've talked about this before, that God is love. 
And there, there are lofty goals that I have set for myself to love perfectly and to have perfect obedience and love. And again, I'm not perfect yet. <laughs> so can I achieve these lofty goals? Odds are against that in this lifetime, but they're worth striving for. Because the more I do it, the more I become Christ-like and the more effectively I can minister to one another. So that's today's lesson. And now we're going to take a moment and then have a conversation. I'm joined today by my wife, Sue, and by a friend from our Anoka group, Carol Lemke. And we will discuss what it looks like for believers to be loving one another. Just a moment to remind you that all notes and video links can be found at our website, which is virtualstudywith.us, virtualstudywith.us. Feel free to use this broadcast or the notes as you disciple someone else, as you lead a small group, or as you dive deeper into your own study of God's Word. We will now move into conversation with this week's guest. Welcome back to the podcast, Being Disciples. Today I'm here with special guest, Carol Lemke, who is part of our group in Anoka. And my wife, Sue, is also joining us. If she has anything to add, she can feel free to do that. And we're talking about our study of the day that we just went through, which is Believers, the Living Stones. As I've said many times, my take is, is that it is the love that is the mortar that ties the living stones together that brings all the disciples together. So Carol and Sue, welcome to the show. Thanks for having Thank you. So, Carol, you've been with us before at Pizza Man Church. For those that don't know, we gather for a lunch once a week, or now it's every other week, at a local pizza shop, and we put some tables down the middle and invite people off the street to join us or guests that want to come and visit our ministry. We have lunch and talk and share scripture and testimonies and encourage one another, pray for one another. What have you seen as a reaction of the people sitting around us when we're there for those events? Well, I think that most, mostly what I've seen is people just looking at us and wondering what it's all about. When I was there, some of the times I was there anyway, I just would notice certain people and a few times the Lord led me to pray for them, you know, just to go up and ask if I could pray for them. And then I did that. So I think that it just was kind of a place that kind of opened the door. So anybody who did come in and saw us sitting there and heard us talking or heard us praying or heard us, you know, speaking about the Bible or speaking about the Lord, you would perk up a little bit and they would pay a little bit of attention to what was going on. And sometimes they would ask, you know, what are you doing? Where are you from? Or what, whatever. And, but frequently I would have people ask me about what church I went to and I would tell them about Noka and I'd tell them about the Pizza Man Church and how we meet together. And What I've noticed too is, you know, we have the commandment to love one another and people will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. They're not talking about going out and loving everybody. Jesus was saying, your love for one another. Right. And I believe that people, you know, that sit around us at the restaurant like that, see us actually loving one another. What do you think? Yeah, I think they do too, because that's basically what we are doing, you know, greeting the other people. And when we say goodbye, we give them a hug or, you know, that just it's showing that, you know, we care for each other and taking care of their meal, maybe, or asking them about what's going on in their lives, praying for them at the table or whatever. I think it's all a good example of what Jesus wants us to do in a place where people can see us. That's what I like about doing that at Pizza Man or even at the other places where we used to go when we would do that, that people would see us and wonder, hey, what's that all about? Start asking okay. questions. So without giving away any of your personal secrets here, Carol, uh, I know that you've had experience helping people and having people help you or seeing others help one another. What can you share with our audience about seeing this love of God flowing through believers one for another, the sort of thing that people would see as being Christ's disciple? What's kind of coming to my mind is just the fact that in my life, the Lord would bring somebody into my life. And as soon as I would bring that person into where I would meet them, even meet him for the first time someplace or whatever, or at my house or wherever. It's like I would just instantly connect to that person and, and they would connect to me, you know, cause then I would find out, oh, they're a believer and I'm a believer and we would just connect and, and it was like, God just put love in me for that person. It's like the spirits are connecting before so you even realize right. anything's happening. Right, so before I'm even knowing anything, I'm realizing, wow, I'm just connected to this person. An example of that would be uh, that person that I brought to the, that has a person you know, Africa just came back. So, I mean, those things have happened to me on several occasions. And even if it meant that that particular person no longer is around anymore, they've moved on, they've gone to another state or whatever, but still that connection is still between us, that the Holy Spirit 
that's formed that, that with us. So um, that's one of the things that I've really found really was best part, I think, is about when God would do that. And so, for instance, after my son passed away and I had to sell all kinds of stuff of his in order to gather money together to pay off his bills, the Lord would send people on the marketplace and Facebook to my house for a particular item that they were looking for. And it's like, they were always believers. Everybody that came to my house was a believer. You know, and I know that was the Lord that was doing that. And he was causing those people to look at my things and, and say, yeah, hey, she's got this. And one example was an item that you would never even, I mean, people don't you know, normally, to me anyway, it's not something that people buy. But my son happened to have a brand new one that he never even opened. And this man was looking for this particular item and he just, the Lord led him to look at me, my thing on Facebook, and he found what he was looking for. And so he came and he bought it. And it was like, and he told me about that. He says, you know, he says, I didn't think I would find it on Facebook, but there it was. <laughs> so I thought that was really interesting because, you know, I mean, I know it was the Lord leading him there for that. And he helped, he just helped me in those ways too, where that's also showing the love of um each of us, even if we don't know the other person, we never see him again or anything, you know that there's a connection because of God and because of the Lord. We're connected to people all over, you know, with a lot of people we probably haven't even met and may never even meet. One thing I also contend is that, uh, you know, it's real easy for us as believers to let that love flow and do things for other people. Lots of times it becomes more difficult for us to allow people to do stuff for us. Like we get this pride that rises up or a false humility or whatever it is where we really don't want the help. Even if we need it sometimes, we initially our reaction is to resist it. Now you mentioned the death of your son and since then you've been through a number of things that you know, you've needed help here or there. How much did you struggle with allowing other believers to come to your aid and to really serve you as loving servants of Christ? Well, I think that that was, you know, that is, like you said, has been in the past, it's always really difficult for me to accept help from anybody because I've always been a loner and I've always done everything for myself. You know, I can do it. I can do it. I don't need anybody. That's always been my attitude. So when I started really needing help from people you know it was at first it was a little difficult you know for me to just let somebody come and help me do certain things whatever it might be but then as the time went on it got so I was realizing I really do need help and if God is going to send me people to help me then I'm just going to have to receive it and believe that they're there to help me and be happy that they're there because otherwise I'm not going to be able to do this or get this done. I, I've noticed ever since my son passed away these past few years and being here in this house, what have you, that more and more, you know, where somebody would offer to do something for me, and I was normally in my flesh, I would say, ah, no, I know, that's fine, thank you, I, I can, I can take it. Knowing that, even though I know I can't because I'm not capable right now of doing certain things. So I've really been able to be able to accept and receive somebody's help and just be thankful for it and grateful for it because I really do need it and I really appreciate it when people do come and help me now and I've learned over the time no you know you can't do everything you need help so just let go and receive it so I'm sure you're grateful to those people and you always express that to them right. after the fact how has that affected your relationship with God I think I probably find have found and and learn this over the years that I really do need God. I mean, we can't really have any kind of a real life without Him. And so instead of saying, well, God's here and, you know, this is good and it's fun and everything and everything is going really good and everything, but then when something happens and you really need the Lord to know that He is there and He's always there, like He says, He, he will not leave you, He will not abandon you, He won't forsake you. He's always going to be there no matter what you go through. So it's a lesson that you kind of learn, and I think it kind of goes along with learning how to allow people into your life to help you and allow people to come in and do things for you that you can't do, that you, you have to put your pride down and say, hey, I just need, I need help. I really do need help. So would you say it's enhanced your spirit of thanksgiving with the Lord? Uh, yeah, I would say that I'm a lot more thankful to him, especially because he, of who he has put in my life and has sent, sent to me, you know, where if I didn't have that relationship with the Lord, I would never have that, those people in my life either. So yeah, I'm really very grateful and very thankful to the Lord for being everything that he is in my life.
including sending people to me, and you know, and having me meet people and connecting me with people. And I'd agree. It's for me. It's kind of a highlights his goodness, that his love for us, that he really wants to care for us. But since he works through people, we have to let other people into our lives to see that sometimes. Right. So, Sue, I know uh, in our conversations, you've struggled a little bit with receiving help also. What was kind of the root of that? Same thing. You just get to the point where you feel independent and you can do it by yourself. You don't need to have somebody help you until it gets to the point where you can't figure it out and the right person comes along and says, this is how it should be. Did you always feel like maybe uh, I shouldn't need help? Is this just somebody showing pity on me or is it really love or what? I don't think it's pity. I think it's just somebody truly loving you and showing you the right way. And same thing, putting them in your life for a reason, regardless of what they think or they believe. I work with someone that I feel that I'm in her life for a reason, and she receives it to a point and has her ups and downs, and you just have to step back and let them work it out and not let it eat up on you. I know I let it bother me. Because it's, I, what can I do? What did I do wrong? And realizing that whether it's real family or coworker family, you're going to have your ups and downs and you're going to make up and work through it. Just for the sake of our audience, Sue works at a place that, you know, there's a pretty heavy darkness these days in the industry she's in. And uh, she faithfully goes to her job every day. And, and she is there to bless clients and fellow workers alike, bringing a smile, bringing a bit of hope, bringing encouragement. And she is the example we're talking about today about believers sharing the love of God with others, whether they're fellow believers or not. But, you know, the fact of the matter is that the purpose of this conversation, the command of Christ is to love one another. He's talking to his disciples and that people will notice your love for one another. And I think through that, I've always seen, and you guys can comment on it if you want, um, that it's that love for one another that the outside world sees. And like you were mentioning earlier, Carol, they're curious about, you know, what is this? But it makes them want some of that in their life because there's so many people without hope, without that loving relationship these days. No, that's true. I mean, I was just thinking, too, about the law. I just came back to my mind about the wall and how the Lord had showed me that the wall was made up of each one of us. Each, we each have a space on the wall. And as he puts up, puts us up on the wall as we come to him, and there, like he was saying, there's many spaces that are yet, yet open on the wall that are waiting to be filled. But I thought it was really interesting that we are actually, like, you know, how, how we all have to come together as one and be together and united as one, which is going to form his body, but it's also forming this wall, too. That's that way because we are united and we're to stand together, each of us. And that's something that still is not prevalent in the church, uh, where churches are still too separated right now. But that's something that God wants. He wants us to be united with each other in love so that we can not only fill up his wall, but form his body. So finally, his body will be perfected, as well as the wall being perfected. And I think that will happen, has to happen, before he's going to come back. It's interesting. I thought it was really interesting that he was showing me that. And if you look at a stone wall, all the stones are different sizes, different shapes. You know, some are smooth, some are rough, some are square, some are oblong. But it says that the stones are fitly put together, meaning that they have their spot. Like you said, there's many spots open. There's a spot open for that specific stone. And when that person comes to the Lord, receives that salvation, they are placed in their spot in that wall. And like you said, it, you both said, waiting for the right person to come into your life that's there for a reason, either to minister to us or for us to minister to. And probably both ways that you know we're placed in the wall next to the person we need, next to the person that needs us, and there's stones on every side of us. Some walls are really thick, so there's stones on every side. You know, and so it's uh, an interesting concept that uh, Peter came up with here for the, the living stones. And then, of course, we're also called the temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? So the Spirit dwells within us. And that Spirit brings that love of God to connect us all together. So that's why I contend that 
but the mortar is the love. It's what ties us together. It's what holds us together. It's what strengthens the wall, that it'll stay together. Because you can stack stones and make a wall, but if you use mortar, it's more likely to hold together and to not leak and to not you know, fall apart as quickly. So love, I think, really is the key. Yeah, I mean, Yeshua left, um, when he left, he, before he left, he said, one commandment I give to you, that you love each other as I have loved you, and you love your neighbor as yourself. Loving your neighbor as yourself has always been something that's been in the Bible, even in the Old Testament, that was said, you know, to love your neighbor. That's what one of the things that the Lord wanted to teach the Jewish people in the, in the um, desert was about loving everybody, each other, and taking care of each other, looking out for each other, and not doing bad things to each other. Just being there for each other. And so when you have a group of Christians who love each other and are all together for each other, we know that we can call on those people. They're there when you really need something and you really need help or something's going wrong and you need some advice or whatever it is. You know that you have somebody that you can call on that will help you with whatever it is that's going on at the time. So it's really, it's pretty neat about the way, um, for me, when I first started reading the Bible and stuff, the one thing that really I really understood was Love your neighbor as yourself. After I finally figured out who my neighbor was. <laughs> After you finally figure out your neighbor is everybody in the whole world, doesn't matter where they live, even if it's in China or if it's in the, you know, in Antarctica or whatever, you know, they're still your neighbor and you love them. Yeah, whoever he brings across your path right. for whatever reason, right? But then there's the other part about where he talks about how Paul writes about this, about how we should be taking care and looking out for each other first. Your family, your members of your church, your group are, you know, your family. So you take care of them first. Not that you don't love everybody else, but you take care of each other first. Well, hopefully you're seeing that in our group that we belong to. Yeah. I'm, I'm impressed uh, as you needed help seeing other members of the group without any prodding from me or anyone else that uh, have offered to come and help you out with things. And they've helped me out with things along the way too. And, and uh, it's all about us looking after one another. Right. All that said, uh, do you have any final thoughts on the matter before we wrap this up? Well, I guess the only thing I could really say is that Jesus is love. Father God is love. The Holy Spirit is love. It's all about love, and it's all about a relationship between God and us and each other. That's what makes this such a beautiful and wonderful experience, is to have all of that. You have the love of God. You have the love of the Holy Spirit. You have the love of Yeshua. You have the love of each other, you know, and it just makes the whole thing, I don't know, it just really makes it a much more beautiful experience and a much more meaningful experience. Because it's not just somebody all oh, there, somebody over there, you know, where you go to church and somebody sits in the front row, you don't even know who they are or what have you. But when you have a relationship with each other and with the Lord, it's a binding thing that just really makes a big difference in your life. I think it also helps us realize our own shortcomings as, uh, you know, we have to humble ourselves a little bit when people are helping us or we're asked to help somebody else and we're not really in the mood, but they need the help. And so in obedience, we do it, hopefully. You know, afterwards, it's kind of humbling to go back before the Lord and repent for attitude or whatever. Yeah. So I think putting us together in this way really is for our own growth and to do the things we looked at in the study about uh, learning to purify ourselves, learning to be holy as he is holy learning about what love truly is and, and how it operates between us. Thanks for joining me, ladies. And uh, Carol, before we sign off here, would you be willing to pray for people that are really kind of needing this love in their life and need the wisdom of God, where to, where to go, where to find it? Yes. Father God, in the name of your son, Yeshua, I just lift up all of your children who are out here in the world hurting, lonely, um, just miserable. So Father, I just ask that you would send the right people into their lives, that they would encounter the right people, people who know you and who love you and who know your heart, that you would send those people to the ones who really, really need you, Lord. And I hope that um, hearts will be open and eyes will be open and ears will be open to receiving the good news of who he is and that he loves everybody. He loves all of his children. God loves all of his children. He wants all of his children to be with him. He doesn't want anybody to 
parish who wants us all. And so those of you who are out there who might be hearing this and listening to this, this prayer, just know that God loves you and he really wants you to be with him. There isn't any question about it. And when you find him, you're going to find everything that you have been missing in your life. Because the things that he has for you are not available in this world. They're only available from our King, our God, our Savior. In the name of Yeshua, amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me, ladies. And uh, we'll see you all next time on Being Disciples. Next week on Being Disciples. How do we measure up as disciples of Jesus Christ? Scripture reveals what we should be concerning our lives, our relationship, our behavior, our views, beliefs, and more. Only by knowing what a disciple should be can we measure how far we have to go to accomplish the goal. This episode will feature Joshua and Sam from our Anoka group joining me for a conversation about being disciples. Thank you for joining us today for this episode of Being Disciples. The show is hosted on Podbean with a webpage at beingdisciples.podbean.com. There you'll find all episodes of this podcast. There's also a patron button uh, you can use to support this broadcast if you feel so moved, and we would very much appreciate that. So thank you. You can also find us on your favorite podcast platform. The notes for, and links for this show can be found at Virtual Study with Dot us. Again, virtual study with dot us. Feel free to use this broadcast or the notes as you disciple someone else, as you lead a small group, or as you dive deeper into your own study. From that site, you can contact us if you'd like to join a study group. If you have questions or comments for Pastor John, you can contact uh, John by email at john.s at anokaawakening.com. And that's john.s at A-N-O-K-A-A-W-A-K-E-N-I-N-G dot com. Please subscribe to this podcast and join us again next week as we learn more about being disciples.